Hey, what's up, everybody? It's me, Sarah G, with the Smack, and I'm back. And um, today I have a very special show here with two people that I really think are awesome. Um, so we're going to be talking about autism and financial advice. And my two guests are Bernard and Burnett Grant. So Bernard and Burnett, welcome. Thank you. So my podcast audience is financial advisors, and most of them manage and uh, help help with financial planning with for people with wealth of a million or more here in the U.S. And I really wanted to reach people with the message that unlike what most financial advisors believe, autism is going to be playing a big role in their businesses in the future. And whenever I talk to financial advisors about autism, or I talk about how I have an autistic child, the response I usually get is, well, my clients are high net worth people and my clients are not autistic. So that's interesting to know, Sarah, about all the you know information trying to give me, but that doesn't really apply to me in my practice. So let's talk about it, guys. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so uh, we're gonna just dispel some of these stereotypes and these, these statements here with facts and knowledge. So first of all, let's talk about the definition of autism. And the reason I asked this question is, and I myself, I'd include myself in the category of people that believed a certain thing before I spoke with autistic people and learned from them. The definition of autism that the medical community and the therapists and the everyone who is not autistic has is very different from what autistic people actually say about autism. So guys, what is autism? Um, oh, I say, I say autism is a neural type. It's, um, it's a matter of neuro neurological lines, um, landscape. It's, um, I say it's experiencing, I experience life in my own space and time. And I'm, um, I, and I, that's part of because, part of that's because I guess my, people don't, some people, autistic people don't like the term inner world, but my mind is, um, it's just as real as like the outside world for me. So I'm very, um, I guess autonomous and I like to be on my own, but that doesn't mean I don't like to like connect with other people. And everything, I see a lot of, my, my view of autism is mostly, um, it's, I, I talk about it mostly from the, the mind, the perspective of how I experience it in my mind. So it's very logical and um, I'm very focused on my interest. Um, I, built, I structure my life around my interest. Um, I guess I'll just stop there. It's hard, it's, I guess, impossible to give a single definition of autism because it's like, how can you give a single definition of a neurotype? Like what is a definition of um, neurotypical or a definition of dyslexic? Um, but a lot of these things are often like um, dyslex dyslexia and dyscalculia. A lot of neuro neurodivergence is um, like, you, as you said, by the medical community defined by um, just what people cannot do or something or in a negative way or deficits, deficits or something, yeah. Well, disorder. Yeah. They use the word disorder a lot. And they use the word disorder, and I, I don't believe that these are disorders. I believe that this neurodivergence is just like, just like the neurotypical. It's just the way your 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 um your neuro your, your neurological landscape. It's the way it's made up. It just. I love that. Yeah. So, natural variations is a great way of saying it. I love that. I love this language. Natural variations is wonderful. Burnett. Yeah. So autism. It's a neurotype. That's how I define it, autism simply. And um, so just as um, everyone has a neurotype or at least one neurotype, I have multiple neurotypes. Um, so just as neurotypical is a neurotype and is a neurotype of most people, autism is just another neuro neurotype. It's just another way, uh, it, 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 your neurotype defines how you view and experience the world and as such is gonna define how you socialize or communicate, how you work and think. And um, um, so in aut autism, if you look at the etymology, it comes from from aut, um, from the Greek word aut, which, is, um, which means self. And so um, uh, 
autistic people view the world from within within themselves where um tend to be more autonomous than neurotypicals yeah as Bernard said, I would just be repeating the same things Bernard said. So yeah, it's just a natural, <laughs> a natural variation of the human condition. Yeah. Yeah. And I love this on this website that both of you worked on that is Bernard's website, bernardgrant.com. And he's got a se section called autism resources, which is for me, when I was reading this website, I mean, I just, I really would love all of you listening to this podcast around the world to please visit bernardgrant.com and visit this section that both of these gentlemen worked on because for me, this was so eye-opening and I'm so very grateful that you wrote these words. And even a lot of my clients have read this website as well, gentlemen, and they have passed on to me that they found it to be very, very insightful. So- Oh, wow, that's great. A lot of my clients have said this too. So folks, for example, um, this is the definition on Bernard Bernard's website that Burnett, I understand also helped with. Autism is a healthy variation of the human condition. Autists are not tragedies, nor are we defective. We are justice-seeking neurodivergent people who view and experience the world autistically, logically, in systems, in details, and in our own space and time, living autistic lifestyles. Yeah. Unbelievable, guys. Yeah, I just want to, because I, I know it's, but as I said earlier, it's, you can't really just define a neurotype, but I want to give as close of a definition as I can, as I could, um, because um, when I was looking to start learning about autism, even though I knew I was autistic for a while, I realized I, realized I kept reading the same resources over and over, but I didn't have a definition. I had all these disparate terms and words. They, they were all separated. So then I made this site, this web page to collect resources for myself but i really i'm really driven by words so i needed to have um to have some some words on there that i can come back and read a few times until i fully felt that i understood what autism meant at least for me and then yeah and i'm glad that some people have said that, that this is helpful to them yeah well for me Having an autistic child, when I first came to see that he had some cognitive differences when he was very young, I didn't, I didn't have these resources. And so everything I was told was that this was some kind of a major thing and like he was never going to have a normal life. And every, it was just this whole horror show that was, you know, that, that um, this picture that was painted for me. And it, it was because I think I didn't speak with autistic people enough, I was letting the world talk over them. And in a sense, I, I feel so bad for all the times that I spoke over my son. Yeah, but. And I didn't know, even though I was doing it. And it, this happens all the time with I, autism. And it, I think it's, well, I, I believe I did the same. Like I found out I was autistic like eight years ago or, in, or eight years before I like came out, but I was doing the same thing. I was believing in um, in the, all the misinformation about autism, I didn't even want to go look it up. And I knew I was autistic, so I just wanted to hide it away and pretend it wasn't real. But then I started to talk, but I wasn't talking to autistic people and I wasn't going to look for true information. I was just believing whatever whatever I heard. So, but um, one thing I want to say is like, the, the, the doctors are saying that your son wouldn't be able to do anything. I think that's so odd that people say autistic people like they look at an autistic child and say they're never going to be able to do a certain thing, but they don't do that with neurotypical children. And it's just, you never know what someone's going to be able to do. You never know who someone's going to become. A, a child hasn't, a, an adult has gone through multiple evolutions of themselves. So they're not exactly the same person they were as a child. And interests change and abilities change. Yeah, it doesn't make any sense. Right. But this kind of thing happens all the time. Yeah. And there are so many, so many false beliefs about this. I, when my son was diagnosed, I looked at it as a beautiful gift because I said, at least now I can learn and I can start to try to get into his head more 
and there will be more resources and more support for me. And it's been unbelievable being able to do that. So what do you know about the trends with autism? Um, I mean, I was reading somewhere that one in 60 children is diagnosed as being autistic. And I think that this is possibly a result of all of the different, the improved diagnostic um, technologies and techniques that are available, more awareness of it. Um, there's definitely, I've, I've noticed, well, I think with the, um, the pandemic, for one thing, more, more people, a lot of more people are, are becoming aware of their autism and neurodivergence because um, when there's a, a crisis, people seek help. Um, and so for the first time, people, or people just, going to get help um, for their anxiety or figuring out whatever is going on with them and discovering that they're, they're autistic. Um, that's one yeah. trend that I've noticed. Yeah, and that, that too, like the pandemic was a reason why I came to accept my autism, even though I, I'd known about it for years, but I just started to feel calm, which I, my experience is opposite of most people. I, I, I didn't experience a crisis. I, I, I started feeling calm because I was at home more, working from home and just not really leaving the house. And I didn't want it to go away. And I, I, I just knew it was autism. So I started researching autism. That's when I made this site. But another thing I want to say is that um, I think the internet too has played a really big role. I mean, the autism community is primarily online, but um, with the pandemic too, people are moving to just using online more. I think <clears throat> a lot of people are like, or are, are accidentally are stumbling into the autism community, which is what I did. I, I got on LinkedIn to start looking for jobs at, um, and I, but I, I had, I had just come out as autistic, but it just serendipitous. And I got on online as I was making the website and I just started meeting autistic people. And then I found the aut autism community. And I know that just a lot of people in the neurodiversity community have been doing the same. They were just on the internet and they stumbled into it. So what are some of the stereotypes that you find people believing about autism that from an insider's perspective is, aren't necessarily true? You wanna start that? Yeah. Maybe you should. My, my thing with stereotypes is they're just so opposite the way that I think that I, I forget them. I forget what stereotypes are. Yeah, <laughs> but I just, yeah, but just the idea that um, autistic people, like as you said, can't be can't have a million dollars or can't be can't be rich. So autistic people just can't do certain things. So um, that we we can't socialize. But the truth is that people of the same neurotype socialize really well together. So I socialize really well with autistic people. Autistic people, uh, neurotypicals struggle to socialize with autistic people. If you have like one neurotypical in a in an all autistic space, they're gonna struggle to talk to people. They're gonna look like they have social difficulties, but it really is just who's around you. So I think just all, all these beliefs about what we can't do, we can't, we can't have jobs, we can't make money, we can't socialize, can't get married or have children. There's a lot of autistic parents um, that we want. I just thought of one, a big one, I, that we want to be normal, is, uh, but would it actually just mean neurotypical? Um, because people think of that as neurotypical as normal, even though it's just another neurotype. But um, I like being autistic. I, I don't. I don't want to change my my neurotypes. Um, I don't want to be neurotypical. Not that I think there's anything wrong with being neurotypical. It's I like being me. So I don't. I don't want to stop being autistic. I think that is one that we we want to be. Yeah. Honest. That yeah. yeah. When I first got on LinkedIn, I I did notice that like people telling me. That people were talking, just people were finding out I'm autistic, and then I'm um, telling me I was brave and that I'm overcoming, oh, overcoming my autism, and it's inspiring, and I'm going to get through this and things like that. And, <laughs> I don't know what that. I don't know what you're talking about. My brain is not going to change, and I, but I don't want it to. Um, and then there's the also the things about autism is an illness, and it's a. A as you said earlier, a disorder, a personality disorder, that there's something wrong with it and it needs, we, we need correction, that we behave poorly and all these other things. Right. Um, yeah, I guess anything, 
most of what the metal community says about autism is is our stereotypes are it's just wrong yeah this idea that you can learn about autism from people who aren't autistic that's um, weird yeah that that's it's not it's not gonna work like um like doctors who are not autistic they're just telling you what they've learned what they've studied but um the autistic experience only lives within autistic people so only we can we can teach it to tell only we yeah you can't learn about it. you have to learn about autism from autistic people yeah i say that i neurotypicals are very confusing to me and i but i don't pretend to understand how their minds work I just I just admit to myself that I do, that neurotypicals are confusing. That um, well, the neurotypicals I can talk to are the honest ones. If if I'm talking to a neurotypical and they they use a lot of subtext and I don't understand, but if they're being honest, then I have a lot of patience and I'm just, I have neurotypical friends who are very honest. But it's just, but I still don't pretend to understand their minds or to understand who they are. But I don't say that they're sick or, or mentally ill or anything. So I, I it, it should be the, like the same kind of thing. It should be. Um, so I'm just admitting, oh, I'm not autistic. There's no way I really understand. Um, yeah. Yeah. So. Oh, okay, never mind. <laughs> no, go ahead. Oh, just one real quick. Um, people, it, it's the neurotypical view of autism and they, the people thinking that what they, they understand what they see. Autistic people do not have processing delay. If um, someone asks us a question and we take a moment to answer the question. Um, it might take us a moment to, longer to answer a question, but we're translating our thoughts into pictures so that we can so that we can we can translate that picture into words. So and um, so and actually thinking about what we're saying. So yeah. Yeah. Deep thinking, I guess, yeah. Right. Yeah, it's amazing to watch my son sometimes in the way that he perceives the world. Like I was trying to teach him once the difference between a penny and a nickel and a dime. And I said, these two pennies are the same. And he said, no, they're not, no, they're not. And I said, but yes, they are. And he said, no, they're not. And I'm, and I'm arguing with him and he says, no. And he points out the, the small numbers on the penny. Cause you know how every penny has like a, almost like a serial number on it, right? And he says, no, those are two different pennies yeah those are those are two different things like he was so literal about it you know what yeah. i mean he sees detail yeah and that's people say people say you're, people have always told me i was too, i'm too literal but i mean the pennies are different <laughs> and, <laughs> and if and if you're autistic then you then you do see the detail the detail just just naturally stands out oh well i have um i have arachnophobia and i've always been accused of going into room because I, I can just point, I just, I'll see, see a spider, and I've always been accused of going into a room and looking for them. And I believe that for a while, but I don't think that I'm looking for them. I think it's just easy for me to see when there's a, a moving dot on the wall. And just like your son seeing that those differences in the pity. And and what your son needed, what your son, in order to understand that message, your, your son needed you to be more specific and say it in his language. Yeah. So what he what needed you to say were these pennies have the same value, not that they're the same. Right. Yeah. So, so like, yeah, like sometimes it, it's like, I feel like sometimes I can't even communicate with my own son because I have to kind of, like, I don't like it when people say, oh, like think of autistic people as being in their own world. I think that's also like kind of a stereotype and because we, we're living in the same world, right? But we just have a different way of experiencing it. But I have to sometimes really look at it through his eyes and then it's hard for me because I naturally want to look at it through my eyes, but it's been so helpful to me in developing empathy for other people. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So we, what advice, just because we only have a few minutes left here, guys, what advice would you give for a financial advisor that maybe has a client who's autistic that they may or may not even know that the client is autistic? I mean, for me, sometimes I, I see some of the typical things that, that my son does or sometimes his anxiety in certain situations. And so now when I see people that exhibit these same like anxious or like exhibit reactions I don't understand, I say to myself, you know, maybe there is autism or anxiety or like I, I've come to respect other people's different responses to me so much more now. And so that's been so helpful and I'm so grateful I've learned this, but like, what would you say 
to financial advisors that are working with folks that are on the spectrum? Um, I say, like as you do with your son, just accept them for who they are. So if someone comes comes in and and they're just not who you expect because they're, you know, you're expecting someone who's more neurotypical or something, and someone comes in um, and you think they have quirks or people call them quirks or oddities. I don't believe that, but just understand, just just accepting no matter who that person is, accepting them for who they are, so, and don't do any of that stuff like pointing it out. Like I, it's weird. People people um, they're always commenting on my personality. Oh, that's unusual, or oh, that's weird. I just like, what does that have to do with what we were talking about? We were having a conversation about something. Why does how? Why do my mannerisms matter? Um, so I think just doing it's it's able is what it is. It it just, but it also just it just it seems it's unnecessary. So I think just treating them, just treating them fairly, and then also understanding their needs. So if someone's if like for some for instance, I'm talking to a neurotypical. I'll constantly ask them questions because I may not understand what they're saying or they're not being specific enough. They're often people are just often aren't specific enough, like with the pennies, you know. Um, so just having patience and understanding that they're not people call me combative. Understand that they're not they're not trying to fight with you. They're just really they're literal minded and trying to understand what you're saying. And also when you when I know when people engage with and when people when I ask questions and people engage with me instead of criticizing me, then we both we both come out of the conversation with learning a lot more because we've done some critical thinking rather than shutting down. Mm -hmm. And canceling instead of canceling, no canceling. But what about the specific accommodations that you could make? Hmm. Um, so are you do you mean like workplace accommodations? Right. Oh like, yeah, I, I believe like if like if there's an autistic like I'm going to someone's office, I'm autistic, I would like to not have a lot of um, whether I'm going to work or just anywhere. I was in the, hot, the emergency room the other day. I would like to not have a lot of lights lights on. Um, no music. Um, the loud music, yeah, loud music really, it can really do it. Well, yeah, everything's louder and life is louder and louder and brighter for me than for most people. So, um, like, if I go to the grocery store, I, I wear earbuds or earplugs because the music makes me very tired and then I can't think, I can't um, talk the, the life the same way. Um, uh, go ahead. Oh, and uh, I would say, be be open to um, um, non-conventional communication styles, which include um, text writing. If if your client might need that, depending on how they're feeling, because um, a lot of autistic people have um, um, situational mutism, and um, you, I don't always know when that that's going to be um, triggered or when that's going to be a problem, and I need to write things down um, in certain environments, especially if it's a new environment for this person. That's something. Oh, something else I want to say too is um, I know a lot of people prefer to have people come into their offices, but if someone prefers a video chat, if, if they're autistic and they say they prefer video chat or something, then you, you're actually going to have a better conversation. You're going to have a better interactions with them because they'll be in their own environment where they can where they can just focus on the conversation. They're not focusing on the environment of your office. It's for one thing, it's not it's not their space. So then um, they might. Like I'm often kind of concerned about whether I'm behaving. If I'm tired, I'm, I'm I'm maybe like insecure and wondering if I'm behaving normal enough or whatever. If I'm in my own space, I have the lighting how I want it. There's not a bunch of noises. There aren't people walking around. So I mean, just asking. Like one thing I say about workplace accommodations, <clears throat> a good thing to say is um, ask people I, um, how they work best. So if coming so coming to your office. <clears throat> Or, sorry, or your meetings with someone, even if it's not work, um, just what do what do what do you need? How can I how can I best accommodate? How you? do you work best? But, yeah, right. I mean, that's a great I, question to ask yeah. anyway. <laughs> we're also individualized, especially autistic people. We're so individualized that our accommodations are not going to be this exactly the same between two or three people. So yeah, just just asking, I think, is the very first thing. Asking. Yeah. The other thing is. For my son, it's hard because when I, like, he doesn't always make eye contact. Oh, that too, yeah. And first, the teachers at school are like, 
he's so like they're they're trying to talk to him they're trying they, first of all the first thing they would do in the morning is like give him a big hug and i'm like don't do that he, he hates that right or like they're like i'm trying to teach him to be polite and to look people in the eyes when he talks and i'm like you're torturing him <laughs> yes. Stop. Nice. They don't, but they, you know, of course, didn't listen, which is why that that year was a real disaster. But this year, we found a school that's very accommodating and understands these things, so it's going much better. Thank goodness. Which, you know, I really think, mm -hmm. you know, we can enable each other. You know, yeah, if we pay attention, but we have to pay attention and ask the questions. So I love what you're saying, Burnett. Were you going to say something real quick? Because we got to wrap in a few minutes. But was there anything you wanted to add? No, I don't think so. I, or even though I forgot, it's fine. <laughs> okay, so um, just to also dispel the stereotype that autistic people are all unemployed, what, which I've heard, okay, from financial advisors, what is it that y'all do? Mm, oh. you know, I'm, just for anything. I'm a um, lab technician. I work in flavor chemistry, so I make flavors. Okay, Burnett's a lab technician, and Bernard. Um, so I'm a writer and editor. Um, right now, oh, I just recently accepted a job as an autism coach, an autism control coach. And but I also edited. I'm an editor at a literary magazine, a fiction editor. And I just finished my PhD in English, uh, creative writing and comparative literature. So I'm just really, really into words. Is what I, yeah. You are Dr. Bernard Grant. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes, right. Okay, folks. Well, listen, this was wonderful. Thank you. Always so nice to talk to you guys. And um, I'm going to put Bernard's website at the bottom of these show notes here. Anything else? Any other resources that you'd recommend? Uh, no, I, I just say um, if someone uses social media, just... Um, as autistic people, find autistic people if you, if you, I say if you can, of course you can. There's, there's autistic influencers and some are on my website, but there's a lot more. So just, just find them. Yeah. I mean, we don't all have the brand. There's a lot of different brands of autism. So obviously people aren't gonna like all this, all autistic people, but there are people <laughs> you're gonna connect with. And so just find some, some people. All right. Awesome. Thank you so much for being here, guys. Thank you so much for your valuable gift to my podcast. And everybody, please follow these websites that we were mentioning. They're in the show notes and we'll see you next time.